Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this conversation. Uh, <clears throat> I'm John Stremlaw from the Carter Center, and I'm very pleased to be the moderator. Um, I am probably one of the more disadvantaged, as I look at the complexion of this audience, to be speaking about Sudan, so I will give a few um, welcoming remarks and then rely on the Right Reverend Ezekiel Kondo, um, our guest from uh, Khartoum, the uh, Episcopal Archbishop of Khartoum and the chair of the Sudan Council of Churches to, uh, I hope, lead off the conversation with Professor Abdullahi Ahmad Anayam, who you all know because he's a distinguished professor at Emory and has a 16-page resume, I can tell you from Google this afternoon. And uh, I could go on with all of his achievements, but his book, Islam and the Secular State Negotiating the Future of Sharia, seems to be particularly pertinent for the topic, identity, rights, and citizenship in post-referendum Sudan. Perhaps one other word uh, about uh, Abdul that I can't resist. Um, Probably, up from praise from your children, the nicest compliment you can get is to be at a conference. We've just had this big conference on the uh, role of religion and gender equality over at the Carter Center for the last couple of days. And kind of spontaneously, uh, one of the participants uh, said, you know, I was a student of Professor uh, Niam, and I must say that it was uh, life transforming experience. He was a mentor and an inspiration my whole life. I don't think anyone in this business gets a better compliment than when a student remembers that you changed their lives. And so I was touched by that compliment and wanted to pass it on in recognition for all his wonderful work here for so long. I also need to give a word of thanks uh, to my colleague, Atunde Kokomo, who um, is responsible for our being together here. Uh, Atundi, I can safely say, has never met a good cause he didn't like. Uh, he is a son of Africa, but of uh, Rwandan descent, and uh, his homeland has been a source of concern and uh, a hope for fostering brotherhood uh, uh, and sisterhood. And his uh, work for the Carter Center in uh, Liberia has been uh, uh, absolutely appreciated, and now he sees Sudan as a special concern while he's uh, an assistant director in the conflict resolution program. So a special thanks to Atunde. He is um, always right and not quite yet a reverend, but uh, he's working on it, and, and we're grateful to him for having organized this and prepared so much of the work behind it. I also want to say how appreciative I am that this is a uh, jointly uh, sponsored uh, event by the Comparative and International Law uh, Center at, uh, uh, or program at uh, the Emory Law School, uh, most especially our partner institution. We are, I was going to say joined at the hip, but more likely the Fiscus, uh, the Institute for Developing Nations. And I see Sita Rensch Nielsen is here, so it's awfully nice to see her giving a vote of support for this and the Carter Center's conflict uh, resolution program and colleague Tom Crick out there as well. So we are well represented here. Now, uh, as I said, I wouldn't say very much by way of opening this conversation, but being a one-time professor myself, I can't resist a few introductory comments. Sudan is a complicated country. Uh, and you all know that, and there are several Sudanese in attendance. But when I think about it, and I started my career in Africa 40 years ago when we thought the territorial integrity of the colonial drawn frontiers, the great paradox of Africa in the name of self-determination, you de defend these frontiers, would not change. And, and, and my wife and I started in Nigeria during the Civil War. Um, the biggest country in Africa, one-fourth the size of the United States, seems to be, uh, by as of July 9th, heading for uh, a negotiated separation. Sudan, in its totality, has about 45 million people, which makes it the 29th largest country in the world. Southern Sudan, with 
would be uh, about the size of, uh, of Austria, so 92nd. And we are going to be talking about southern Kordovan. And that's about the, the same population size as Latvia or Namibia. So it would be um, uh, certainly a, 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 a size to be a member in good standing in the United Nations. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm just uh, reflecting my experience of the last couple of days uh, talking about uh, uh, the universality of, 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 of human rights. Um, but I can't resist recalling that the right-wing writer, and British writer E.H. Carr, in background to nationalism, I don't know, 70 years ago or so, after World War II, said, you know, God created us, and we create everything else. And that is to say that certainly these things we call nation states are very much human conditions with all creations, with all of their shortcomings and all of their difficulties. And in the case uh, of Sudan, uh, uh, Britain, when it um, uh, granted independence in 56, did the country no favors in terms of creating conditions conducive to uh, coexistence, because as all of you know, there was a war from 55 to 72, when I believe the World Council of Churches stepped in and helped facilitate a ceasefire that lasted for not very long, and then from 83 to 05, we had another round of conflict, uh, estimated loss of life in excess of 2 million. Um, the Carter Center was involved, has been involved with Sudan for some 28 years, and in 95, President Carter briefly negotiated a ceasefire so that uh, health programs could operate in the South. We have a big program down there to eradicate guinea worm, the last country of really significant a prevalence of guinea worm before it's eradicated uh, globally, and, and, uh, and there's still 3,000 cases down there, and the conflict makes that difficult. And just anecdotally, when uh, it shows you how the, the, the world tends to work uh, funny ways, uh, Carter was the only Democrat to show up for George W. Bush's inauguration, uh, the only f uh, prominent former president Democrat uh, uh, to, sh to show up. And, it, and, and um, Bush was very grateful and asked him, you know, what can I do for you? Is there something you'd like? Is there a favor? And he said, point a special envoy to Sudan and see whether or not you can come up with a peace settlement. And that was John Danforth. And eventually we got the Comprehensive Peace Agreement of 2005, which brought the Carter Center back in under its democracy program for last year's election which was an integral part of that peace agreement, as you know. And it also involved having the follow-on referendum in January of this year uh, on secession that brought such a strong turnout in the South that points to the independence of the South as of uh, July 9th, uh, 2011. Now, I can't resist uh, uh, noting that the stereotype typical view of the South is divided between uh, uh, the uh, Arab Muslim North and the uh, Southern Christian animist South, African South, is a gross oversimplification. Uh, the, the diversity and complexity, the most gen genetically diverse continent in the world, Africa, has Sudan listed as having 597 597 ethnically distinct groups, 400 languages and dialogues. The South is a state in formation. The North is a state which is kind of frozen in time like so many African countries, and now we see North African in the Middle East, where the colonialists leave, you get a constitution, you have one election, and then you have a series of faux elections. And the North, of course, has been under military rule really since the 1950s, and between the Mary and and, and now Bashir, uh, one military uh, autocratic leader, what's going to happen in the north in the aftermath of the secession of the south? South Cordovan and the topic for tonight or the focus, which is going to be difficult for my conversationalists to grapple with, and so I'm treading a little bit now so I don't have to say anything during the course of their exchanges, is you know, to explore the socio-political implications of Sharia law in current day Sudan, the impact of the referendum on North Sudan, that's another big question, 
South-North relations after secession. This was Atunde's way of saying we've got a lot we could talk about for probably a good deal longer than the time allowed. Uh, but it is not um, uh, uh, in, uh, impossible to see the spreading Arab Spring uh, hit North Sudan. Uh, the uh, way that the International Crisis Group talks of South Cordov Southern Cordovan is the next Darfur in one of their you know, they're always giving a, a, a quite a headline to their, to their, to their um, uh, analyses. Um, it reflects, I think, the problems and challenges of governance. And I guess my last, last point is we'll be talking, and I hope that we can start this conversation on a fairly broad level of uh, nation building and uh, governments of national unity. Whether it's a government of national unity in the south, a government of national unity in the north, or a government of national unity in the Cordovan, southern Cordovan region, um, these are not easy to do. And if I uh, end with a confessional, since this is a very uh, spiritual gathering, both uh, uh, two devout men next to me who will be in this conversation, uh, I, I, I would say as an American, that uh, our record on governments of national unity has not been great. Uh, I mean, our founders in 1789 had only 13 colonies and a lot of homogeneity, and they put together a government of national unity with, of course, a fundamental uh, uh, birth defect, as Condi Rice likes to refer to it, by enshrining uh, African Americans as only three-fifths of human beings uh, in a compromise to get the South into that government of national unity. And they also, in order to get the unity government formed, put in um, an imbalance, a democratic deficit that gives today Wyoming voters 66 times the power in electing senators than does California. Uh, you know, 14 of the conservative Midwest or Western and Southern states have 28 senators. California has two. I can go on. It is not a pretty picture, and it's particularly poignant for someone who works at the Carter Center because that's where General Sherman commanded the Battle of Atlanta in 1864, and that was the bloodiest war in history uh, up to that point. So when we talk about governments of national unity or the role of elections, which the international community now thinks are so fundamental, thank heavens, to move a, a, a territory or a, a post-conflict country beyond uh, uh, a conflict and into more popular sovereignty rather than autocratic or one person or party rule, um, we Americans have to be rather humble in how we talk about these challenges that face a country as complex with a history, my goodness, uh, Islam and Christianity go back to the uh, sixth century in, in, in Sudan. And yet, uh, and this is my segue into maybe starting the conversation as I, as I sit down, um, Reverend uh, Kondo uh, might give us a, a sense of how he sees the emerging processes of uh, nation building of a government of national unity, either in southern Cordovan or in the north where he is based in Khartoum, when he reflects a significant minority, but if the CIA World Factbook is right, it's about 5% that Christians comprise in, um, in, in, in Sudan. And if he, as the Episcopal Archbishop and as the head of the Sudan Council of Churches, is looking forward, what role will they play and how safe and secure will they feel in what is going to be a very difficult and complex negotiation. Bashir has already talked about applying Sharia law to the north once the south secedes. That has to be seen in some quarters as ominous. And again, as an American, I say, when Americans think about what makes this country maybe someday great, if there's one subset of our society most responsible for forcing the majority to live by the principle on which it was founded. It was African Americans who forced Gettysburg and forced the rebirth of freedom around one person, one vote that we're still struggling to make. So what role does minorities play? Maybe Reverend Kundo, as I sit down, you might give us a little update on how you see the unfolding political process um, in the North and with regard to uh, Southern Cordovan. 
and then uh, Abdul can pick up and carry on from that if that's okay. So thank you very much. That was a little long-winded introduction, but I think we're ready to begin. And we'll do conversation for 30 minutes and then Q&A. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, first, let me say I hope you will understand the, my Sudanese accent. I know the American accent is so different, and I hope you will be able to understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, first, let me say I am really grateful that I'm able to be here. And I want to thank uh, my brother again, Aitonte, uh, uh, for uh, <laughs> you know, getting in touch and uh, making it possible for me to, to come and attend uh, uh, this conference, I mean the conference that we had. Uh, so thank you, and I want to thank you very much for coming for this uh, conversation. I think uh, this shows that you people are very much concerned about the situation of Sudan. And so, on behalf of the Sudanese people, I really want to thank you. Thank you for having been following our situation. Thank you for uh, being supporting our situation uh, over the, the years. Many of you have been praying for Sudan uh, since the struggle and uh, the war, the civil war for uh, many years ago and uh, many of you have been advocating for the cause of Sudan and particularly this uh, country so I want really to thank you. Um, I think John has already set light on the uh, situation and how difficult situation he is because he began uh, to say that Sudan is a complicated country. It's a complicated in the fact that the country Sudan consists of so many different ethnic groups and I think that is why there has been so many uh, problems. Secondly, as he said, Sudan is so big uh, in size wise, uh, that is why maybe because of that also there has been a lot of problems. Uh, but let me say that we thank God that after uh, many years of uh, conflict, lastly Sudan was able to achieve peace in 2005, uh, known as CPA, and uh, of course, the CPA was assigned leading into uh, a referendum for Southern Sudan and ABA. There were two referendums, uh, one for South and ABA because ABA was considered to be a separate kind, even though it is uh, uh, nearer to uh, part of the South. Um, so we thank God that referendum took place as uh, it was uh, stipulated in the agreement. Uh, but as uh, Sudan Council of Churches, I, pre I represent the Sudan Council of Churches and Sudan Council of Churches has been advocating uh, for peace even during the war. Uh, but before I say that, let me just correct one point that uh, John has mentioned. He addressed me as a Archbishop of Khartoum. I'm not. I'm the Bishop of the Anglican Church in Khartoum, I mean in Sudan, but uh, the Diocese of Khartoum. We have an Archbishop who is uh, in Juba, is based in Juba. So John. So I promoted you, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe he's coming. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? You are right reverend though. <laughs> I am indeed. Uh, and so that's just the point I would like to clarify. And so Sudan Council of Churches as a chair of Sudan Council of Churches uh, 
This whole body is an ecumenical body of churches in, in the country, including uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and so over the years during the war, uh, Sudan Council of Churches has been following very close, cl closely and uh, being with the people and uh, uh, working for peace. Uh, church leaders met the two parties to agree instead of fighting. Uh, and so in 1996, they issued a position paper known, no, known as Here we, we Stand United in Action for Peace, calling the two parties to stop fighting, but they should sit down and resolve their differences. They continued and uh, again in July 1999 they again reaffirmed, I mean Sudan Council of Church reaffirmed that position uh, with a position paper known as Together We Remain United uh, in Action for Peace. March 2002 another uh, paper was issued known as Let My People Choose and in March last year, 2010, uh, another document was issued known as Choose Life, a Vision for a Peaceful Sudan. And uh, all these times, Sudan Council of Churches has been really advocating and uh, working that peace should be achieved. And the last uh, document, uh, they have said and I just want to quote this uh, short. Uh, that was in March 2010. They said, after referendum in 2011, Sudan will never be the same again. Whether it remains united or becomes two countries. Time is short and urgent. Uh, reflection and action are needed to ensure a peaceful future. This is Sudan's Kairos moment. There is no time to waste. Mm. So that was the statement that was issued in March last year. And indeed, uh, I think Sudan is no longer the same. Uh, we have achieved this uh, <coughs> referendum peacefully, which we were very much afraid, and uh, indeed many people were afraid that the uh, 9th of January may be a problem. But we thank God that uh, referendum went peacefully, uh, and most importantly, that the results were accepted by all the stakeholders. However, uh, the problem of Sudan is not over yet. Because we have a crucial uh, issue, which is the uh, issue of ABA. ABA referendum, which is supposed to have taken place the same time, 9th of, of January, has not taken place up to now, because the two parties have not agreed. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, an issue which need to be resolved if at all Sudan is going to maintain this peace. This is one uh, very critical point. The second uh, issue which also need to be resolved is the two areas. Uh, John spoke about South Kotofan, but there is another, the other area is uh, uh, Blue Nile. Uh, Blue Nile and South Kotofan have got the same arrangement. And the, arrange, uh, the arrangement is the popular consultation. This popular consultation, people in these two areas were supposed to be consulted through uh, an elected uh, legislative assembly, which the members were supposed to consult people whether the peace agreement has made 
their aspirations. And if not, then uh, they had to negotiate with the central government uh, in Khartoum. We thank God that the Blue Nile have carried out their referendum, I mean their uh, uh, elections, and uh, they are now in the process of uh, popular consultations. However, uh, South Kotofan has not yet it had to carry out uh, elections because el the last election uh, which uh, the Qatar Center was very much involved was done partially in that region. They elected the president, they voted for president and the members of the National Assembly. But the uh, Regional Assembly and the governor are yet to be elected. And the date has been set, which is 2nd of May this year. Uh, but when you see this, the time is very short. And whether they are going to do it peacefully and that the Assembly is going to be elected in order to carry out this uh, 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 consultations <coughs> we do not know. And this is, this is, these are two areas. It's not only a matter of popular consultation, but uh, there are concerns that even this peace agreement which has been made and the arrangement which has been made for these two areas do not meet the aspirations of the people of these two areas. We have the issue of the army, the SPLA army from these two regions. The arrangement is not very clear. Mm -hmm. Whether they will accept to be integrated into the Sudanese army or not, this is yet to be seen. And I see that this, if not handled well, it will also bring uh, a new situation. The third uh, area of uh, concern is the issue of oil. Up to now, the two, the two parties have not agreed on how they are going to uh, share the oil after the 9th of July. So this is uh, another issue of concern. The other <coughs> issue of concern is the boundary situation. Because the boundary situation, they, they are supposed to term, uh, work on the boundary, boundary between the south and the north. Up to now, this has not been done. The other thing is the issue of citizenship. After the 9th of July, the southerners who are in the north, we do not know what is going to happen. Are they going to be now foreigners in the north or not? And this is another issue which also is a concern that if they don't resolve this uh, situation, this is going to be uh, an issue. Uh, and of course, we know, all of us know the Darfur issue. Uh, Darfur is another, another point which, of course, is outside the, 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 the CPA, but it has been uh, a problem <laughs> since up to now. And uh, we do not know. Of course, the, 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 uh, the, the, the negotiation is going on in Doha, but it seems there is no headway. So these are the issues. These are the points that are very much concern uh, for the peace and the, uh, the nation building that John has referred to. Uh, for the churches, in the north, uh, we also feel very much concerned that if after the ninth things are not really put right, the, we feel very much that uh, the churches in the north are going to suffer so much under the Islamic uh, uh, government and uh, last December, I think uh, some of you, if not all, heard the president saying, of course, that was before the, the referendum. 
and I'm glad that my brother um, Professor Naim is here, who is the uh, person concerned with the with the law, and uh, is a citizen of uh, of Sudan. Uh, in December, President uh, said publicly that uh, if uh, Southern Sudanese vote for secession, say Sharia law is going to be uh, fully implemented in the north. There is going to be one religion, one language, one culture. And this to us was so uh, serious as, 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 as far as the Christians in the north are concerned. There are a considerable uh, number of churches in the north and uh, we feel that uh, what the president said uh, during that time is not acceptable and we as a church uh, say that we don't accept what the president has said because whether uh, uh, South Sudan goes Sudan will remain diverse country because you have people in the Nuba Mountains, people in Blue Nile, even people of Darfur, people uh, in the east, even then further north, they have their own language. Where are these languages are going to be taken? And so he said, this is not uh, an acceptable uh, statement. We said it in public. We issued uh, a document on this. And because of this, we were even summoned to explain why this has come up. Um, and we said, well, if you t talk about uh, religion, you take Islam and, and Christianity. I think all of us know that even Christianity came to Sudan before Islam. And therefore, both religions must go together if we are going to maintain peace and stability uh, in the country. So, uh, to summarize uh, my, my talk, is that in order to build a nation, of course, I think uh, government of national unity is now the time has gone uh, because we have left with few, uh, few months. Even uh, the members, the southern Sudanese members in the National Assembly have been uh, were asked now not to come this time because their time has gone. They have voted for uh, cessation and therefore they should not they should now work uh, for South Sudan uh, Assembly. And so we are talking about nation building of the two countries now. North Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, so, in order to build these two countries, there is a need to maintain this peace that has been achieved in 2005. And to follow the spirit of the referendum which went peacefully. And in order to do that, these issues which I have mentioned they need to be resolved before the 9th of July. The ABA, South Court of Iron, Blue Nile, the boundary issue, citizenship, oil, Darfur, these issues, there are so many issues, they need to be resolved before the 9th of, uh, of July. And if the Sudanese people don't accept one another as Sudanese, even the remaining country, my fear is that they may still split apart if the authorities uh, are not careful to handle people together as the Sudanese people 
and the rights of the minority, and if, if they are not respected, I'm sure also things will not go well. So let me stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I, I speak as myself. Uh, I'm from Northern Sudan, so-called. I was born in a village on the Nile, 200 kilometers north of Khartoum. So I'm, uh, I am as north as you get. I am African. I'm not an Arab. And Sudan is an African country. I am an, an African Muslim belonging to that part of, of Africa and struggling with it as all Africans are struggling with their parts of the continent. That is my point of departure, you might say, or starting point is to see Sudan's situation in the broader African context, uh, a post-colonial context, in which we remain, I think, very much in the, in the colonial in our mindset. Uh, I speak sometimes of what I, I hope is the post-post-colonial, meaning that the time that when we no longer reference colonialism as a frame of, of reference for our thinking, but to think of, of ourselves as people of Africa who are trying to come to terms with how to organize politically, how to organize pol socially and culturally and economically and so on. And in my own work, I try to appeal to uh, uh, efforts to invoke sort of the, the, the pre-colonial organic types of connections that Africans uh, used to have. Uh, after all, the notion of the nation state, so-called, I don't like to call it the nation state because the, the notion of the nation is problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, it is rather more accurately territorial state, that these states are defined by territory, but they are not of nations. In fact, na nation and nationalism have been problematic in many parts of the world. So it is not something that we should try to emulate or to try to re-enact in, our, in the, our African context. But to think of ways in which different peoples uh, can organize politically, socially, culturally, uh, accepting the need for larger scale political organization, but not defining it in terms of nation. Because that is problematic, I think. So let me, without taking too long, just highlight a couple of points. Uh, very much, uh, I will come to the Sharia question, uh, because it's something that, as a Muslim, I am very much concerned about and totally oppose. I think it is just simply reckless uh, sort of bravado. Al-Bashir was bluffing, and he remains bluffing, that Sharia has never been applied in the north or the south or anywhere else. Sharia is not for the state to enforce. The state is incapable of enforcing Sharia, whether it is Iran or Saudi Arabia or anywhere else. It's always a human secular device uh, to manipulate political power. I will come to that if you wish uh, in more detail. But let me start with our title somewhat. For me, as, uh, as a Sudanese, as an African, as an, a Muslim, as many other things, identity, yes. Rights, yes. Citizenship, yes. But not in terms of national unity, but in terms of acceptance of difference as something that is inherent to the human condition. So I believe in pluralism not unity. Unity is not an end in itself. Unity is a means to an end, which is human dignity and social justice, individual freedom. Those are the values and the ends that unity is supposed to serve. And any unity that uh, just uh, undermines any of those true uh, ends is not worth having. I think Reverend Kondo spoke very much, uh, very clearly and very powerfully in terms of we have two months to do what we have failed to do in 40 years. <laughs> so I think we have to shift the paradigm completely. I don't think that uh, it is just a question, of course, I mean, of course it's easy for me to say sitting here at Emory and uh, to say that the whole Sudan paradigm has to shift. Uh, we lost our only national leader since independence, which was John Garang. 
because none of the northern leaders of the political parties can ever claim to be a national leader. But John Garang have shown by the time of his untimely death that he was the only and the first national leader we have had in our post-colonial history. And the point is for me is how to, to really carry the vision of John Garang that made him a national. You know, just I think maybe my claim might sound a bit exaggerated, but when John Garang came to Khartoum for the first time after, of course, he used to live in the north and he used to be part of, in fact, he was teaching at some point at the University of Khartoum, where I also used to teach. Uh, but when he came to the north for the first time after the peace accord, he was met by two million people. Every segment of every population of Sudan throughout the Khartoum area and beyond was there to meet him. There was never a, a, a sort of a popular, stronger support that any leader had enjoyed in Sudan. That's why I say he is the first national leader that we had. And his vision was a vision that was worthy of, of, of being carried forward and he gave his life for it and that is where we have to get to head. He kept talking about a new Sudan, a total restructuring of politics, of social relations, economic relations. That is what it takes. And it's not going to be realized in two months or in two years, but it can be started in a single day. Uh, and that's what I would like to emphasize, that it is, yes, uh, the notion of identity is critical and important for all human beings, but none of us has a single identity. We all have multiple identities. Everybody, everywhere, there is no single human being who has a single identity. We differ in religion, in culture, in gender, in language, in socioeconomic status, and all of that. So it's about what I think of as overlapping identities rather than this sort of monolithic identity. So all of us, I mean, with all due respect, I would say the Reverend Kondo and myself are people of multiple identities. And it is not the, uh, the, object, the object or the objective to have a monolithic identity. It's neither possible nor desirable. The challenge is to create conditions and systems whereby people can have their multiple identities and even claim more. And yet, the, the sole single uniting element is citizenship. So for me, I speak of equal citizenship for all the men and women and children of Sudan and anywhere else in Africa and beyond, even in this country too, why not? And also of rights, fundamental rights as citizens of our own country, equally. And our right to our multiple identities, but it is not in terms of minority and majority. And here maybe, again, checking the question about the title. When we identify as a minority, we are inviting really uh, hegemony. The point I make is, Everybody, because of our multiple identities, is a member of minorities in some respects, majorities in other respects. Uh, and, and the point is that not to see ourselves or accept being seen by others to be a minority. Because we are not united in whatever it is that is supposed to set us apart. Um, you know, like in terms of, of religion, I mean, that's why al-Bashir's claim is just total, uh, as I say, uh, reckless bravado, because there is no single Islam either, as there is no single Christianity or single anything. The diversity is inherent to the human condition, even in our understanding and practice of religion. What we can speak of, therefore, is affirming our equal citizenship as a basis for contesting and negotiating everything else politics, economic relations, and all aspects of our life, we can, but citizenship we cannot compromise on. And it has to be equal citizenship for all. Th those are the bases on which we can begin to build the vision of uh, John Garang and others who share it, uh, which is not going, as I said, to be done in two months or two years, but as, as, as we as uh, being credited as being pious, say that God did not make the world in a single day. 
Uh, meaning that sort of so long as we are on track, it, there is no set goal or benchmarks uh, that everywhere stability, economic development, social justice are built over time. And there is always a challenge that remains. The question is, do we have the right foundations? Are we on the right track? And for me, the right track is equal citizenship, fundamental rights for all equally, uh, multiple identities to be negotiated, uh, but uh, not to be seen in terms of exclusion and inclusion of anybody. Uh, I take it that, so I'm talking about Sudan's post-colonial history. I think the notion of post-colonial is really a myth in the sense that we are still colonized and colonizing, that colonialism, colonialism is a state of mind. It's not just only simply about uh, military conquest or physical occupation. So long as our mindset is colonial, and I think it has remained within our national boundaries, so-called, that some parts of our population colonize other parts. Our men colonize our women, and so on. So that is the level of challenge that we have to bring. Uh, now, finally, let me, so I don't take too long, but just simply focus on this, this notion of Sharia. The point is that Sharia is no longer Sharia by the very act of enacting it as a state law. It becomes the political will of the state, not the religious law of Muslims. For Sharia to be valid as a religious uh, sort of normative system, it has to be followed voluntarily. As soon as you impose it, then it is, it is the will of the state that is being obeyed, not the will of God. And the will of the state, of course, is the will of human beings who control the state. So my, my, my position is to say that there has never been an Islamic state. There can never be an Islamic state. The state is a political institution, incapable of being religious. Sharia can never be enforced by the state. No matter, of course, the claim is made. But the fact that the claim is made doesn't mean that it is true. I mean, we, we hear about white supremacy, for example, in this country. The fact that some people claim white supremacy doesn't mean that th there is white supremacy. So why do we accept claims like al-Bashir's claim when we are willing to crit uh, critically think of other claims being made and reject them as nonsensical? Now, the question of Sharia, and not, even if you take the, the even if you said my more radical position of saying that Sharia can never be enforced by the state, even if you take for the sake of argument that Sharia can be enforced, who is the state, what right do they have to enforce it, and upon whom, and to what ends? Al-Bashir came to power through a military coup and maintained power through terrorizing the population and manipulating power and wealth, corruption, all sorts of atrocities and all sorts of, of uh, nothing to do with Sharia in terms of its own uh, sort of claims of, or, and objectives. So what right does he have to have Sharia enforced on everybody else when he is not enforcing it on himself or his, uh, his close associates? There have never been accountability for massive corruption. There have never been accountability of mass murder, of rape, we, we had never had, I mean, this regime that claims to be enforcing Sharia has never conducted an investigation into the mass rapes and atrocities committed by the Sudan armed forces on local populations in Darfur and in the south, and the atrocities are really horrendous. Now, so the claim is, is, is even if you accept the possibility, you know, Al-Bashir is not in a position to make the claim, and it cannot be done. It is really uh, absurd to think that you can't do it. You know, like in terms of criminal justice, in terms of land tenure, in terms of economic, every aspect of life for a believer is regulated by Sharia. But that can only be done by the believer observance of that, not by the state enforcing it. And we have never had it. It has not happened in northern Sudan since 1983 when Numeric claimed to have introduced it. So I think that what I'm saying is that we, as Sudan, uh, let me just finish with one remark. I think we in the north have sort of hidden behind the south for too long. That we continue to 
uh, say that we can't really uh, live by Sharia or Islamic State because we have such a number of our population who are not Muslims and we cannot. The North has to speak against an, an idea of an Islamic State in its own name, in its own voice, and not by saying because of the South or because of the Nuba Mountains. Because of me in Shendi, I am from Shendi, which is the town north of Khartoum. As someone from Shendi, I refuse to be governed by Sharia as enforced by the state. Until Northern Sudanese are willing to say that, and I think they will have to because they will see again that this charade will, will not continue, and the claims will be empty claims. So I think, for me, I'm sorry to make it more complicated, John, I mean, <laughs> but I think it is, it is really a question of a fundamental shift in our thinking, which can be followed by action, but unless without that paradigm shift, I think any action we take will be in the wrong direction. And it will be just simply political maneuvers. You know, spinning, uh, spinning your wheel, they say here. Uh, when you are spinning your wheels and not moving anywhere, that's what will happen to us. So I hope we can begin take this challenge uh, Reverend Kondo very seriously to say, let us shift the paradigm and reject, I mean, head on the claim of an Islamic state, of Sharia being forced by the state, of uh, the no racism, have to be confronted. Sudanese, like Northern Sudanese, like many other people around the world, are racist, but that is never acknowledged. Uh, and, and until we do, I mean, people always talk about the United States as, when you say the United States has a good, uh, stable situation, they say, but look at the racism. Racism is everywhere. Maybe the, the, the advantage of this society is that has, it has begun to struggle with it, has started to come to terms with it, whereas we are still in a state of denial. Those are the sort of issues I think we have to put on the table going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, time is fleeing, and I would like to engage the, um, the group. There are many of you, and uh, it might be helpful in light of the way the scene has been set by our, 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 our two lead speakers to keep focusing our minds on what will be the framework, if there is one, to preserve citizenship. We're always worried about the worst case and the likelihood of return to conflict. Bend your minds a little bit about what might be the best case. This extraordinary last six years has had a framework agreement known as a CPA, and all the stakeholders stuck to the CPA sort of pretty much with a lot of pressure, concerted pressure by the international community. I mean, the fact the international community was prepared to say, let the voters, let the citizens of Sudan, north and south, first decide on their continued governance in the April, April 10th election and then the referendum on the question of secession. Um, Reverend Kondo has pointed to, to some of the imminent problems on the horizon. We all know that after July 9th, uh, there's going to be uncharted waters. Um, how should, do any of you wish to address R Reverend Kondo or Professor Nayam on, 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 on their thoughts of what might be reasonable next steps, thinking of Obama's injunction that Africa doesn't need strong men, with all due respect to John Garang or for or Salva Kiir or, or Bashir or his successors, it needs strong institutions. And, and, and what's the minimum steps that would protect s sovereignty? And because Sharia is so close to this question of what's the prevailing legal framework, that may be a good place to continue. But why don't you address your questions to them and see if we can engage a little bit so in the next maybe 45 minutes we leave here, if we take some liberty with the deadline to end, uh, with at least an idea of what we should be thinking about over the next few months with regard to the citizenship issue and the framework agreement uh, that might be possible. So, um, and I can see hands up already, and, and if there's a microphone nearby, uh, my colleague Tom Crick has already caught my attention, so. Thanks. Um, John, to try and address your question somewhat, uh, I think we probably need to think more deeply about the, or not more deeply, but think deeply about the nature of the, the northern uh, state that will now be created and the, uh, the polity there and the politics thereof to, uh, to have any chance of uh, answering uh, Professor Anaim's 
uh, challenge that can a sort of a new national vision be created? I mean, how realistic is it, is it to think about a new national vision in the north of Sudan? Um, I know perhaps the bishop will take comfort from invoking the, the vision of, of John Gorang, but the, um, uh, while it's true that, uh, as you say, Sharia cannot be implemented, there are many other things that the state can and has implemented, as you described, that are of great concern to the bishop in terms of uh, the uh, you know, possible Islamicization or whatever the, you know, the term was in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and to some degree, you know, I always was raised understanding the Sudan war as being one of uh, self-determination and the role of religion in the state. And the, uh, there's some sort of realists, perhaps cynics, perhaps it's accurate, I don't know, um, I welcome your views, who say that the, sort of the, the fundamental deal behind the CPA was that self-determination would be traded for um, the, uh, the freedom of religion, uh, that the South could go free but the North would not accept the, uh, the until then inviolable demand for the, the secularism. And then in some ways, the creation of the South has uh, created further problems in the North. And that without uh, fundamental change there, which is unlikely to come through the ballot box, given the, uh, the ICC's uh, role, there's, there's going to be uh, uh, maybe hard times ahead for, for the bishop and, uh, and the population, uh, regardless of, of their uh, religion uh, in the North. Well, thank you for, uh, for this uh, uh, comment and uh, a concern. Uh, I, I think, um, indeed, what, what, what actually we need, I think I agree with uh, Professor Naim that uh, we need equal uh, opportunities in Sudan if Sudan is going to maintain its uh, you know uh, so we need this uh, equal opportunity equal citizenship equal rights um, so that we keep Sudan together which is remaining uh, so mm. Yeah, uh, just to, uh, I think, of course, uh, in fact, I had here in my notes, the politics of limitation versus the politics of imagination. That we have to imagine things before we, dec we can begin to make them happen. Uh, and that is the level of challenge I'm re I, I realize. You know, but I think if you think of uh, so-called the Arab Spring, uh, now they call it, if you had asked two, two, two months ago, uh, of Tunisia without uh, Shazali or Kai Egypt without Mubarak, it would have been in totally inconceivable. If you, 20 years ago, if you asked about the world without the Soviet Union, it would have been totally inconceivable. So I think what we have seen our, in our lifetimes in, same, in terms of how people can transform situations, and very fast when the will is there, the, the, you know, think of 89, and think now of 2011, the spring of 2011, already I think the region has just transformed in ways that are very significant. So that is what I mean about, uh, you know, like the challenge has to be to Sudanese themselves. I mean, others can only help. But if the mindset is not transformed among Sudanese in terms of, and, and what, when I said that the North had hidden behind the South for too long, that the challenge now is confronting the northern Sudanese. And it is no longer possible to t sort of hide behind the south. Or behind, and even now I hear, because I'm part of all sorts of networks, and seeing, you hear people talk about, how about the Nuba Mountains? How about southern, the Kurdufa, southern the Blue Nile? Again, we are sort of t uh, avoiding the issue. The question is, how about Shandi, where I come from? How about Halfa, how about Kasala, about any part in the north? So I think that that is why I think I believe in hope uh, and possibilities, when, especially when people are confronted with a totally hopeless situation. That's when hope is, becomes most real.
Who else would like to join? A mic? Thank you very much, and thank you to all three of you for really important comments. Um, my, my question is, I think, framed by something the professor said, but it's really for both of you, um, Bishop and, and Professor. And it's, it's sort of reflecting on your comment that uh, because of multiple identities, everyone has minority and majority status in some aspects. But I'm struck by how uh, minority status, for instance, is often not as much just a matter of identity, but is about power and relationships between powers. And in fact, the sort of accounting processes, the count them up exercise of being a smaller group, numerical minority, or a larger group, numerical majority, often could be irrelevant. We all know uh, within that region of so many examples where numerical minority ethnic, linguistic, or religious groups are actually those in power. So I'm wondering how you might both think through this framing of multiple identities and majority and minority status within a plexus of power relationships where, for instance, conflict entrepreneurs might actually create or manipulate identities for the purpose of securing and maintaining their power. Uh, thank you for, for this. Uh, first of all, um, yes, the issue of uh, majority and minority, uh, I think it has been uh, a concern uh, for us in Sudan for many, many years up to now. And uh, I think if people don't take it that God has created uh, people the same, whether they are minority or majority, the, 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 the important thing is that they respect the dignity of human beings. If they don't take this very seriously, then uh, I mean the world in that matter will continue to be in a problem. Uh, uh, what, I'm, what I said uh, for, for, for the churches in, uh, in the north are going to face challenges, more challenges after the 9th of July because the voices has been already being said that uh, uh, they, they, they will have no regards to other, 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 other faiths. And this, is, this, is, uh, this means that they are saying that because they are the, the majority, they had to do this on others. Uh, and so this, this to me uh, is, is, is a concern. There are also other voices even in the, in the south that there they, 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 they are a certain majority of people who are trying also to, to do the same for, for, for the minorities uh, in, in the South. Uh, and so uh, I think this issue we need really to be tackled well, that people have to be respected uh, wherever the, their categories uh, are. I agree. I agree completely. And, and the point about identities being multiple is not to deny the realities of power relations, the realities of economic relations, but to understand that the, exactly as you put it, the manipulation of identity politics, uh, which in fact is always a ruling clique minority who are ruling in the name of a so-called majority, which is really as oppressed as the other so-called minorities. And my point about challenging or, or trying to move away from the politics of minority is to say that um, that instead of uh, uh, that, I am Sudanese, a citizen of Sudan, and beyond that, I can be many other things, which uh, some of which I will share with the, with the bishop, some of which I will share with other people in this room or not. So it is it is it is that idea of of a shared common ground of citizenship. And beyond that, the rest is negotiable. Uh, I mean, the idea that you can belong to one minority or another in terms of politics, economic, even sport affiliations. You know, like you can be a, a majority of this town, maybe Hawks fans, I don't know, or not. So all of these types of things, yes, we, that is what being human and alive is about. But the point is our fundamental rights as equal citizens, that is non-negotiable. The rest we can t sort of choose to be uh, so long as, in fact, so the notion of citizenship is to enable, uh, uh, to challenge power relations, to challenge economic relations. But if you concede 
that northern Sudanese so-called Arab are a majority, and we know that they are not Arab, we know that they are not, all of these are myths sort of created through discourse. Uh, Sudan is not uh, an Arab country. All the way to northern Sudan, I mean, Nubia. So I am Nubian, he is Nuba. You know that, I mean, the, the, the idea that Nubian of northern Sudan and Nuba mountains or Nuba of south, south uh, Kurdufan, so, so, I mean, these ideas, I think we allow it to be sort of simplistically hijacked and then lament the outcome. And that's what I'm saying. But not, not, to, to, not to underestimate the, the danger reality, realities of, of power relations, of economic power relations, and all of that, which remains with everybody throughout. I mean, nobody is out of this in this country or anywhere else. We have a question way in the back. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, with this notion of citizenship, are you suggesting that a secular state is the answer? And if so, where then is the role of religion within the state? What problems do you foresee you know, for this situation? Do you want me to start? <laughs> Let me start then you end. Yeah. Um, Yes, I, I, I'm actually, um, I think uh, the, the, the churches have already said that uh, they would go with the, with the, with the secular state. Uh, why? Because they see that the, the one, one religion cannot be imposed on, on others. I mean, uh, of course, in Sudan, there are two major religions. Uh, we have a small, small, uh, even the traditional yes. beliefs. But the two, that is uh, Islam and Christianity. And we say, we, all of us are Sudanese. If you are, you are Muslim, you go to pray on a Friday on a mosque, but in public, public uh, issues, we are together. The same thing with Christians. You go to church on Sunday, they pray, but in public events, they have to work together for, uh, for the country, for the nation. But as far as the religion is concerned, it is you and your God. But for other things, this is something different. So uh, we are saying we cannot accept that one religion has to be imposed on others, whether being the minority or majority. They have to be in its place. Yes. Uh, uh, there is no religious state. The state cannot be religious. It's, the state is a political institution. It's incapable of having a religion. So whenever we speak about a religious state, what we mean is a state that is controlled by an elite who are enforcing their view of religion. And when you see it in those terms, you realize how dangerous it is to concede that the state can be religious. So no state is religious. Now, is it secular? It may not be secular enough. My definition of a secular state is that it is one that is neutral regarding religion. The state as a political institution does not take a position on religion. Religion is for believers in society, not for the state in the state institutions. The state institutions are bureaucracies. They don't have a conscience. They, are, they can't hold beliefs, but human beings do. So what you, your question was, so the point for me is that the state can never be religious, but it may not be secular enough, and that is what we need to, or define what secular means. Secular is not hostile to religion. In fact, the argument I make for an Islamic state, I have a book called Islam and the Secular State, Negotiating the Future of Sharia. And in that book, the first sentence of the first chapter I say that I need the state to be secular so that I can be the Muslim I choose to be by conviction and choice. 
which is the only way to be a Muslim. And I t sometimes to make the point, I, I take the case of Iran and Saudi Arabia. They both claim to be Islamic states, but to each other they are heresies. For the Wahhabi doctrine of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Shia Iran is a heresy. For the Shia Iranian, Saudi Arabia is a Wahhabi doctrine is a heresy. And yet you find Shia in Saudi Arabia forced to live under a doctrine they believe to be a heresy. And you see Sunnis living in Iran having to live under a doctrine they think is a heresy. So th this idea of an Islamic state that can enforce Islam on anybody, even on the Muslims. So the point was, was very much with, 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 with Reverend Kondo is, the, is not that religion cannot be enforced on anybody, including people who subscribe to the same religion. Because their view of that religion will be different from those who control the state. So I'm saying whether it is Ethiopia, where you come from, where I am, Sudan, where I come from, the state is never religious. Let us struggle to make it secular in the right way of being neutral so that people can be religious. This country has a secular state, but has one of the most religious societies in the world, the United States. And people see a connection to say that because the state is secular, people can be more religious than so-called Islamic states where people can, do not have the choice to be religious in their own way. Same could be said about South Africa, but uh, I can't resist noting I was in Cairo a couple of weeks ago, and this debate is raging through Cairo right now. <coughs> they're, they're all ready to, to welcome you and, 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 and lead the discussion there as you're leading it here, but I think there was a question down front, sure, and then one over there. Okay, we'll take one here and then one over there. Thank you all for coming. Bishop Kondo, um, two of the problems you mentioned, uh, the threat of imposition of Sharia law um, on Christian churches in the north and the control of oil pipelines and the revenue from them between the north and the south, which one do you think is more likely to break out in violence either in the next two months or the two months after July 9th? And since international pressure is really invested in this process, how do you think they will step in if this violence does occur? Oh, mm -hmm. sounds like a term paper in the works over there. Uh, which one will likely bring more problems? I think the, the oil. Um, you see, of course, you know the, 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 the pipeline coming from, bringing the oil from the south up to the north. And the government in the south is saying now, before the 9th of July, they got to uh, agree on the percentage. Because I think the agreement is that they will uh, allow the, 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 the oil to flow to the south uh, until a certain time. But then they had to agree what percentage they should, they should now get. Because the, 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 um, uh, more, I mean the, the oil is coming from from the south. And so up to now the agreement has not been reached. And so if it is not reached up to the, the, the 9th of July, the government in the south is saying they are going to block. I don't know how they can do that. But saying if the agreement is not reached, they are able to block the oil not to flow to the north. And this is likely to bring problem, big problem. Uh, as, 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 as far as Sharia is concerned, uh, actually for me as a, as, a, as, a, as a bishop, I mean the Muslims are free to, uh, impo I mean, to declare Sharia, but they should not impose it on others, as uh, Professor Naim said. I have no problem with it. Let them do it as they want, but it should not be imposed on others. Uh, so uh, these are the things that uh, I just need to mention. Thank you for this question. Uh, just briefly to, to put in the question of water. Uh, because I think water is more precious than oil. Uh, it, is, it is going to be more attacked. I, I, in fact, I, I often put to my brothers from the south, to, the point is, how do you leverage your power over water in gaining control over oil maybe and everything else. So it is, it is uh, remember the Nile waters issue that um, 
the White Nile flows through the south, most of the Nile, or some of the Blue Nile also flows through the south. So it is in terms of the tributaries and so on. Uh, the water Nile, the Nile waters have so far been controlled by Egypt primarily and Sudan second. Mm -hmm. The 1929 agreement, 1959 agreements. But now we have Ethiopia contesting the issue. We have now Southern Sudan contesting the issue. So there is something that we can, people can use to negotiate without having to resort to force mm. or violence. It's a good, good point. The first, first trip of the Prime Minister of Egypt after the revolution was to go down to the Sudan and talk about water. There's a question in the back, and then we'll come up to the front here. Bishop and Professor Anaim, in working in the South, I want, I want to invoke your imagination as we talk. Working in the South, it was possible to see communities of various ethnicities and religions, Christian, Muslim, traditional religions actually working and coexisting. And I think they were able to do that because they had a, an acceptable common enemy. And even now, as the referendum has gone, you've seen some of those divisions starting to flare. I'm wondering, are there examples in the North that you can point to where there is at least some semblance of coexistence, equal citizenship, as a space to build from as we're starting to imagine this uh, egalitarian northern Sudan? Good question. Yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, equality and uh, being together even in the north, there hasn't been a problem. I mean, the religion has not been a problem before. It's only, it's, it's only in, the, you know, in, the, in the political uh, leadership that the problem rises. Yes, I think you are right to, 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 to say that uh, South Sudan, maybe the people are together, they respect each other, religion and everything is there, they are Muslim, they are Christians. Um, uh, but this, these days, you know, there has been some conflicts uh, in the South. And uh, of course the government uh, of the South is pointing fingers to the North, that is the North is doing this, instigating others in order to create uh, a problem in, in in the south they they are saying there is there there are they have evidences and they have all, all the proofs uh, and that is why they are they are saying this this may be true this may not be true but the thing is that uh, people need to know that religion is between you and your God, as I said. But the, the, the country, the state, is for all. And therefore, they should work for the good of the state. I agree. I think that, uh, in fact, historically, again, I mean, we tend to think of Africa or these situations in Sudan and elsewhere over the last 50, 20, 60 years. But we go back thousands of years. I mean, for me, the, and I think this point can be demonstrated and shown to be true, I mean, factually as, as empirically, that the whole talk about an Islamic state and so-called religious uh, divides of this nation are, is a post-colonial, is a late post-colonial discourse. In my own lifetime, I've seen Sudan throughout the 50s and 60s, um, where people lived peacefully, and uh, the, the, there was uh, a, a war in the south, which was not in religious terms, but it was religious exercised, you might say. So, I mean, as everywhere you find struggles over power, over resources, this, this is very human. Conflict is permanent. There will never be a time when there is no conflict. The question is violence, not conflict. And the question is, whereas as there is conflict within the north, within the south, within everywhere, within the same family there will be conflict, the question is, do you mediate that conflict peacefully or do you resort to violence? And I think that what we see, I think that I very much agree with Reverend Kondo that away from the centers of power, uh, from the higher echelon of power, I mean, uh, in terms of people's lives in communities, 
I know it for a fact in my own life, and there are others who testified to this, people live coexist peacefully and respectfully. Yes. So it is religion as a political tool of power, not religion as a lived experience of believers. Question down here, yes. Oh, okay. Next, the next one. He can take the next one down here. Um, we've recently seen a few Sorry. protests in Sudan, um, or at least attempts to protest. What kind of impact is this going to have um, upon Omar al-Bashir's administration? And um, my next question is, how can you uh, combat the corruption in, uh, in Sudan? Mm -hmm. can, can you repeat the first question, please? We've rec recently seen protests in Sudan uh, against Omar al-Bashir's administration, um, or at least attempts to protest. What kind of impact is this going to have on Sudan's near future? Hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, indeed, there have been attempts of uh, demonstrations, but this was halted by the, the security, by the authorities. Uh, and I think what, uh, what has been going on in, the, in Egypt and the Middle East uh, people are seeing and uh, they are watching and uh, I think if the system continues in this way I think people will come up one time one day they will not they will not to continue in such uh, situation uh, I'm sure what uh, what has taken place in the Middle East uh, will also affect uh, the Sudan uh, the other question corruption, corruption. Oh, corruption. Corruption in, is in all over the place. Uh, and uh, it's not easy. Uh, and it does not mean that you misuse uh, maybe public funds only, but there are other elements of, uh, of corruption uh, goes with it. Uh, the government of South Sudan has uh, formed uh, a corruption commission for corruption and they are trying very hard to uh, work on this uh, issue uh, but I think it's going to take time whether in the north or in the south it's going to take time uh, and again this goes together with the uh, system with the equality uh, I think it go together if you respect the human dignity then you will be able to you know, to eliminate corruption in this society. Very much. I think exactly that the second, um, that the answer to the first is in the second, that is, if people have citizenship and democratic institutions, then you have transparency, you have accountability, and then you can tackle corruption. But almost tackling corruption is a luxury that uh, we, we almost like, it is just a problem like that we share with all other human societies. Our problem is those problems that are sort of destabilizing the country completely and creating a fundamentally difficult situation. Uh, as you know, I mean, there are corruption campaigns and strategies and efforts throughout Africa and beyond. But the point, on the first point, I have no doubt whatsoever that there will be a time when al-Bashir will be overthrown. Because nothing is permanent, okay? <laughs> Maybe God will take him, I hope, sooner. But, <laughs> but e even if not that, I mean, in Sudan we have had two, uh, you are from Sudan too, you, you may have read about this, I know you haven't seen it. I saw it both. In 1964, the Sudanese people rose in a popular uprising that overthrew a military regime. So Sudan was the first African country to become independent. Sub-Saharan African country, 56, before Ghana, 57, mm -hmm. for the Africanists in the, in the room. Sudan was the first country to experience a military coup, 1959. It was the first country that was able to overthrow a military regime through a popular uprising, October 1964. But the military came back, 69. It was overthrown again by a military, uh, so, 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 sort of popular uprising in 1985. It came back three years later. So my, my question is not overthrowing al-Bashir. The question is what will happen after that? 
And if we do not prepare for that, we are going to repeat the same cycle. We'll take the promise question down here, and then I'll try to give the other side of the room a little fair shake before we adjourn. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we know that uh, the CPA was negotiated mainly between two parties, the NCP and SPLM. And when we talk about the government of national unity in Sudan, actually we call it national unity, but it is between two, mainly two, two powers, SPLM and, uh, and the national, the NCP. Uh, now, uh, after the CPA has been implemented for all of this time and it is just about to be concluded in about two or three months, there are still issues that uh, both speakers spoke about. Uh, the boundaries, the citizenship, and all of those issues are still there. To what extent do you think that uh, those issues were there because the other political parties and the other uh, uh, powers in Sudan were excluded uh, from the negotiations of the CPA in 2005? And the second thing is I have a comment about, uh, about Africa needing uh, strong institutions rather than strong uh, uh, characters or leaders. The strong, I will just uh, argue that the strong institutions of this country here have been put in place or at least started by strong leaders. So probably the strong leaders are still needed in Africa to have those institutions. Thanks. Uh, the first uh, question of the CPA and that uh, uh, it has been between two parties, the NCP and SPLM, uh, that is true. Uh, but you know, when they came, they tried to bring in uh, some of uh, the other political parties. Indeed, some of them, they were able to include them, and those who have... Uh, uh, maintain their principle, they refused. Uh, and so as you know, the, 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 the last government, even this one, it was an appointed uh, kind of, uh, of a government. It's not, it was not ele elected, because it was true, it was uh, between the, uh, the two parties. Now they, uh, they are trying to negotiate in order to bring after, after the 9th of July, I mean the government in the north, uh, trying to bring in uh, the other political parties in order to join the current government and there are still negotiations and uh, some of them are trying to accept some of them are still uh, we don't know whether they are going to accept or not the same thing in the south they are also want to include some of the other other small political parties but it's also still it's not easy uh, for for the other the other uh, the second point, I will uh, I'll leave this for Professor Nye. Mm. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think that the question about institutions we definitely we need to have them, but the question is how, not whether or not. And I think Abdullah is right. Abdullah Hamidan is also from from Kurdufan actually too. Uh, and maybe v lives very close to where you come from. But the point is that uh, it, it is not only that it's Africa doesn't need strong men. It, it needs all men and women to be strong. Yeah. Uh, that is the need, not, not that. Uh, so, to, uh, so the point is not the, the, the notion of the strong leader is assuming that everybody else is following. But if everybody is strong, that is what is the basis of democratization, sustainable democratization will be. When everybody is a citizen in her own right, not following someone else. And I think you are right about the, 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 the CPA being uh, between two primary political parties or, or sides. But with all due respect, the rest of the Northern Sudanese political parties are neither political nor parties. <laughs> They are not really worth of respect. I mean, they have been selling out to this current regime over and over again. They are not democratic in, in their own governance as political parties. So how can they hope or pretend to give or to lead the country into democratic struggles when they are not democratic themselves? Sadiq al-Mahdi has been the leader of the Ummah party since 1964. And Mohammed Osman al marghani has been the leader of the, of the, the Ummah party, of the Unionist party. And they are there not by virtue of internal democratic election, 
but by virtue of their sectarian affiliations. So th th that is the problem. Even the Communist Party, so-called, they still call themselves the Communist Party of Sudan, they are willing to accept Sharia. Uh, I mean, they declared so recently, uh, they say we have no problem with Sharia. So, uh, so that's why, yes, it is, I think you are right, Abdullah, that the Southern Sudan, Northern Sudanese political parties have not been included. But the question, are they worthy of being included? I'm sorry to sound so negative about it. We're, we're, we're getting close to the bewitching hour. I see a couple of hands up. If, if we can take, there are two hands. Is that about it? Let's take these two quickly. All right, three quick, but, and then yeah. with the, if, if Professor Naim and, and, and Bishop Kondo will both give an answer and a final parting word, then we can adjourn before do too much violation to the. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much. One, one of the, the, the issues that you, um, uh, Bishop Kondo, mentioned is that four problem, which I think it is one of the real big problems in Sudan. Uh, I think it is as critical as the other problems uh, that you, you have mentioned. Uh, but now with, with the fact that South is really going to be, I think, in, on its own and is going to, to have its own problems, uh, I think the, the critical political role that they were playing in the past, you know, and uh, especially during young girls, I think was pushing for you know, resolving that four problems. I think that, that mean now it's disappearing actually. You know, now the South is trying to you know, that they're trying to establish their own state and, you know, they have their own affairs. So uh, do you think there will be any luck for, for that audience, you know, to see their problems addressed or resolved, you know, um, probably between now and the time that you, <laughs> you say they would like to see all those problems resolved? Why don't you pass the mic over to your uh, neighbor and then we'll take one last question from the uh, back. <coughs> Thank you so much. A lot of things have been said about uh, Sudan, and one thing is certain, uh, Sudan is a very complicated uh, country. Um, well, I, my question would be directly addressed to the problem of Blue Nile and Kodofan. Um, Bishop mentioned uh, very vividly that, that the popular consultation will be carried out in which uh, the people of uh, Blue Nile and Kodofan will participate in some kind of uh, uh, election in which they would be asked if their aspirations are addressed in the context of comprehensive peace agreement. Well, I would like you to speak, uh, if you can, what are these uh, aspirations that were addressed in comprehensive uh, peace agreement for the people of Blue Nile and Kodofan? And in all this dichotomy, dichotomy of North and South, where does, uh, I mean, where do Blue Nile and Kodofan belong politically? Are they in the north or in the south or in somewhere in the middle? I, I don't seem to understand that. Uh, my last comment is rather on um, uh, the idea of transforming the mindset of the, of the Sudanese uh, to inspire the Sudanese to find a common denominator, probably uh, human, humanity. Uh, in which they can define their citizenship. Well, I think it, has, it, it will be very difficult uh, to achieve that uh, premise because for the last six years, uh, within the context of comprehensive peace agreement, uh, the Sudanese were given six years to explore the chemistry and see if they would maintain the unity of the country. Uh, but with lack of a visionary leader, it did not happen. And unfortunately, we are seeing now the South is separating and the North uh, is going on its own. Uh, so I, I don't see if <coughs> this is possible, if we are lacking visionary leader and we are lacking any political environment that would uh, help people transform their mindsets. Well, after those provocative and big questions, it uh, certainly is poetic that our inspirer of this meeting, Tunde Kokoma, should have the last question, because I saw your hand up. So. Uh, Always eloquent and loquacious. Yes? <laughs> Firstly, thank you very much. Two very brief questions, if you'd permit me. One, um, could you speak, and we've pointed to it, uh, both implicitly and explicitly, but if you could speak directly to 
the viability of what is now a two-state solution. <laughs> is the South, as an independent state, geographically or territorially still to be defined, a viable, does it have a viable future? Does the North, as an independent state from the South, have a viable future? We've pointed to these, but I, I would very much like to hear you address that question specifically. Secondly, Sudan borders, this, the whole Sudan borders nine countries, which one could almost argue covers all of the regions of the continent, from the very north, the Red Sea, to the Central African Republic, DRC, into the Horn, into East Africa, right? So the situation in Sudan has the ability to impact a much larger geographical uh, lo location than itself. <laughs> could you address the regional implications, and by regional you could point to all of those, the regional implications of this is a post secession environment um, after July 9th? Was that, is that fair mm. enough? Mm. Mm. Our speakers can use yes or no if they choose. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, we're not going to stay here till midnight. So uh, it's in your hands to be selective in your answers. And then a final word from both of you would be awfully nice, and I can adjourn our meeting. That's a good one. <laughs> Darfur. Uh, I think Darfur is, uh, is really an issue. Uh, and I think you're right to say that uh, maybe South Sudan, the government of South Sudan is now uh, working on uh, its own, you know, trying to f uh, establish their own government. And therefore, they will not mind of speaking on, uh, on the other, other places, other, other, other issues. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the Darfurians themselves, they're supposed now to uh, unite. And, uh, because they, they, they have been negotiating in Doha, <coughs> and uh, I'd hope that they may come to um, agreement with the, with the government. But the problem is, because there are, there are so many functions which uh, they cannot uh, work together in order to achieve their own uh, what, what they want. And I think that is, to me, is a, is a, is a problem by itself. Uh, maybe the international community should really come in in order to uh, uh, come in in order to to help in this situation to bring to bring together these functions to speak with one united voice in order to agree uh, with the government. This is the point I would like to make on uh, uh, Darfur. Uh, regarding Blue Nile, uh, South Kordofan uh, is 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 uh, they, they are, as I said. Uh, their agreement, their, their, uh, the CPA in the agreement is, is different. They are the same, which is popular consultation, not a uh, referendum. And uh, is to ask the people uh, in regarding the implement, it's actually the implementation of, uh, of the CPA. And if you ask why was the, the protocol of, uh, for, for Blue Nile and South Kutuvan, they different than the South. The answer is that these two places, uh, according to the uh, 1956-56 yes. uh, boundary, they belong to the north, not to the south. And therefore, they had their own uh, separate protocol. And uh, actually, if you read the protocol, there is nothing in that protocol. There is no actually, I say it. I said uh, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, issue of uh, Blue Nile and South Kotofan is like fire under ashes. And if it's not uh, handled well, it will come up. You know. uh, and so this is the, the issue of uh, uh, Blue Nile and uh, South Kotofan. Um, what... Uh, Tundi raised whether the two um, emerging countries, that is North Sudan and South Sudan, be viable uh, countries. 
I think they would if they maintain the peace and security. But if there is no peace and if there is no security for these two um, uh, countries, the uh, problem will continue. Uh, and the implications of this, yes, indeed, you are right, it will affect the, not only the two countries, but the whole region. It will affect the, the whole region because, as you, as you mentioned, that Sudan is bordering nine countries, and therefore it will, it will really uh, impact on, uh, on, this, uh, on this region if uh, the situation or if this is, uh, the problems are, are, not, are not resolved. Uh, I agree on all counts, and let me just simply briefly add that the question of citizenship is the key to every part of, of Northern Sudan or South Sudan. I mean, that without that, there is no peace. Without that, there is no security. With that, there is possibility of everything else. So that's why my focus is on citizenship and equal citizenship, because Darfur is uh, it's about economic, political uh, struggles, but Without cit equal citizenship, there will be no possibility of negotiating and mediating uh, lasting, sustainable solutions. And to speak of unity in Darfur is also misleading because, again, there are many differences within Darfur as there are within the South, North, and everywhere else. So uh, unity should not be the object. The object should be a shared understanding of citizenship for all equally, and then other ways of t living together as different people, not as the same people. Uh, the, the, the illusion of unity, I think, is, has been destructive because people tend to suppress difference instead of allowing it to, 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 to flourish, in fact. So therefore, uh, the key there, and as, the, as it is with the Bija in the east, as it is with South with Blue Nile, all throughout, it is the same issue of citizenship, equal rights, human dignity for all. The two states, are they viable? Again, it depends what you mean by viability, meaning that the, uh, either of the two states is rich enough with resources uh, and uh, human capital that it can be extremely prosperous and stable and everything else. But neither can do it without a fundamental e understanding of what is known as a national settlement. Uh, that we understand that we share this land and we share its resources as citizens of the same. This is a challenge for the South as it is for the North. Self-determination is, uh, I, you know, being in a law school, I, I tend to challenge the, the notion that self-determination is realized through only through independence or through political. It is a constant right, meaning that so long as, you know, it's never over, and you are constantly pursuing it within a single country, within divided countries, the same challenges, within the same town, within the same household, the same challenge of how to allow equal dignity for all, shared understanding of, of resources and so on. Now, I agree with, with Bishop Kondo very much that there are going to be regional, regional implications, but precisely because of the region, the, the region can influence what's going on in Sudan. So for the, regions, for the rest of the region's stability and, and peace, it needs to invest in stability and peace in Sudan. And it can deliver on that because whatever arms, whatever resources that are going to go into feeding violence in the north, in the south, or anywhere else are going to come through those three other regional countries. So the, the, it is not going to be flown in from where? Because, <laughs> you know, like, again, the, the, in that respect, I think it is not different from other parts of the... Think of the, the uh, DRC, I mean, in terms of... Uganda, Rwanda, even Z Zimbabwe was in DRC at some point. So th these regional struggles, I think one of the legacies, I'm sure Africanists will understand this very much, is that that 1963 Africa, Organization of African Unity mandate to maintain national boundaries at any cost. The cost has been too high, and national boundaries will not be maintained at the end of the day. So let us keep... Um, unity among people, not unity among territories.
What a wonderful line to close our, our, our conversation. I, I, I want to begin by thanking you, the audience, for making this a very uh, interesting and lively evening, certainly from my standpoint. If you think you missed anything during the course of these complex proceedings, it's being webcast and will be up on the Emory website and on the Carter Center website. Uh, the Carter Center undertook the most complex, longest, most costly uh, election observation mission of the 80 plus it's done in Sudan. The final report just released this week on the first round of the election is available and the project manager, bless her heart, Sarah Johnson, is in the back of the room and if anyone would, of you would like a copy, Sarah, I'm sure can ar ar arrange it. It'll be a while before the referendum final report is out. Yes, Sarah? Uh, it'll be a few months. A few mm. months. The, the, the first election was extraordinarily complex uh, and, and fraught with challenges and great stories. So this is a must read. Well, maybe not must, but you should try. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, I thank you all for, for coming. But of course, I uh, most of all am, am, am pleased to express appreciation to uh, Professor Naim and, 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 and Bishop Kondu. This was the start of a conversation. I hope it will continue among you in the days and weeks ahead, and I hope we can have uh, Bishop Kondo back for another round before too long so we can see where we are because the Sud Sudan's future is something that could concern us all. So thank you all for coming, and thank you very much. Thank you.